So, okay, so I've mentioned we're going to be unpacking the Sermon on the Mount over the next few weeks, and I'm very excited about this. But in order for me to start this series on the Sermon on the Mount, um, which was a sermon that Jesus gave on a mount, so it's all there, it's like deep theological, um, you know, the Greek word for mount is mountain. Did you know that? Yeah. Also in Durban, that's called a hill. If you're not in Durban, that's called a hill. But if you're Durban, it's called a hill. And you look down over the hill and you see them catching fish. The other day, Caleb said fish. And we're like, yo, here's a Durbanite, eh? Here's a Durbanite. So I want to start at the end. I want to begin with the end in mind as we start to begin. So just a quick one. The Sermon on the Mount is traditionally from Matthew 5 to 7 or Luke 6. We're going to be unpacking from Matthew this particular time for no other reason but because I got there first. And so um, we're, going to be, we're going to be spending a bit of time in Matthew. But I just, I just, in order, I just feel it will help us grab what's being said here is if we start with the end in mind. Because it gives us the call to action, and I believe it needs to be the lens through which this passage of Scripture needs to be read and consumed by us. So if you want to turn to Matthew 7, verse 24, you'll see we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, um, and it says this, anyone who listens to my teaching, he's referring to the previous three chapters, and what he's obviously going to be saying, you know, coming up, because this is not the only time he teaches, but this is a reference to the Sermon on the Mount, the, the kind of preaching and teaching that he's just unpacked, and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching, referring to the sermon he's just given, and subsequently teaching he's going to be given, but this is particularly pertaining to the three chapters of teaching he's just given us, and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds house on sand, when it rains and floods, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Beginning with the end in mind. So I want to just, just focus. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts. So from the very beginning of this, we, we, we see that Jesus, this is not just the listening gig. This is not just sitting and passively absorb passively letting words wash over us. This is letting words enter our soul that call us to an action. When we hear, we must do. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. So straight away, at the beginning of the series, this morning, we understand the lens through which we are listening to and unpacking these three chapters of incredible wisdom and life guidance that Jesus gives us, and it's so much more than that at the same time, all of that is to be listened to and absorbed through the lens that is, we are going to do something with this. We're not just listening for the sake of listening. We're not just listening for the sake of growing. We're listening for the sake of doing. These words of Jesus are a call to action. Augustine said that these words are the perfect standard of Christian life. They are the foundation of our faith, which is not just words, but action. In other words, this sermon, it's probably one of the most, if not most famous sermons and con consequential sermons of all time, is the lens or the grid through which our doing happens. Through which our doing happens. Our Christian way of life, which is following Jesus, becoming his apprentices, it's all happening through these words. If you want to know how to follow Jesus, this is how you follow Jesus. This is the guide. This is the picture that Jesus paints for us, our Christian way of life. And these words can handle storms of life. If we, if we absorb them and we imbibe them and we work them out, these storms can handle, these words can handle the storms of life. They are deeply foundational to our faith. These words call his followers to do what he teaches. To do what he teaches. And if we don't, it's foolishness. Like trying to build a house on sand. And if we do not stand on, on solid rock, but we stand on sand, that pressure, the NRSV tells us, 
great was its fall, referring to the falling down of the structure. Both of these men, the one who builds on rock and the one who builds on sand, it's very clear, both have heard, both have heard the words of Jesus. That's he's referring to. Both have experienced, yet one builds on the words of Jesus and one doesn't build on the words of Jesus. And as a result, there's a collapse. In other words, this is an invitation to hear or ignore. This is make or break for our faith. For the listeners on the side of a mountain all those years ago, or like us, you get to read this today. This is a make or break, listen or ignore moment for us as Jesus followers. That's what he's telling us. And the parable itself about building a house on solid rock or building in a house of sand, if you were in this church in 2016, you would have seen this entire wall collapse. You know, we found out subsequently that the foundations of this building are actually built on sand. Behind us is a big dune. Bourbon Bush, for those of you who don't know, fun fact for the day, is the world's largest prehistoric dune. Largest and oldest prehistoric dune. How's that? Back in the day, the triceratops used to bodyboard right about here. This was where the, this was where the shore break was, you know? It's where it was. And so the, the collapse of the wall was as a result of that. The foundations were not on solid rock because sand shifts. We've got an architect in the house, Rog, and he, he knows this. If anyone comes to him and says, listen, I've got a dream house, Rog. I would like you to design me a dream house. I want to build it right in between the piers on North Beach. Just there. He's going he's gonna, to, this is going to be very hard to do because sand moves. Sand shifts. And this parable itself is simple and very self-explanatory in a country where heavy rain can send flash floods surging down the normally dry wadis, those little, little passages, little areas of land just where these dry riverbeds would be. With devastating effect, people knew the impact of a flood. Durbanites, we know the impact of a flood. And this was a really good picture for the contrast between sensible and foolish, hearing and ignoring. No particular building site or type of construction needs to be focused on or specified in this example. This is, this is simply a mud brick house built on rock or sand. Are they susceptible to the effects of flooding or not? because of its foundations. And the point is not the sustainability or the suitability of building materials, but the solidity of the foundation on which the building stands. The importance of a solid rock foundation is echoed throughout Scripture, but the, the building basically remains safe and secure against threats. Safe and secure against threats. So now we know the importance of the sermon that Jesus shares on the side of a mountain all those years ago. This was a big moment for the people that were following him. This was a reality check. This was, are you hearing me or are you going to ignore me? Are you going to build this into your faith or are you going to ignore this away from your faith? John Stott, one of the OG theologians of all time, says this, Jesus confronts us with himself sets before us the radical choice between obedience and disobedience and calls us to an unconditional commitment of mind, will, and life to his teaching. This is an invitation for us to obey the words of Jesus. This Sermon on the Mount presents us Jesus' moral vision and summons us to follow him, beckons us to follow him in a way that no one was expecting. Jesus is the solid foundation. He is the foundation of our faith. He is our bedrock. It is through him and only him that we can live the life that he's called us to. It's only through a foundation on Jesus. And so when we come to faith in Jesus, this is our game plan. This is our blueprint. Jesus shapes us to live a life as described in the sermon. His expectation is that this is the life his children will live. This is the way his followers will, will walk. 
So let's get going. Let's go back to the beginning. So we're going to turn now to Matthew 5, verse 1. But it's very important that we understand in these moments when Jesus does stuff like this, there are lots of dramatic moments. And if we don't have an understanding of the context and culture of the day, we can sometimes just miss something. Um, we can just miss it. It can, it can go past us so fast that we, we, we lose sight of the power of the moment that is happening here. And there's something that's quite incredible about the book of Matthew and about the sermon. Matthew is presenting Jesus to the people of Israel as a new Moses figure. Now, if you know your history of the Bible and you know the Old Testament, you'll know that Moses was a pretty big deal to the people of Israel. In fact, in the hearts and minds of the Jewish people, Moses was like as close to divinity as you could really get as a human being. Moses was that big a deal. He, the stories, the imagery, the imagination, the romance of the story of Moses and the freeing of the, Israel, of the Jewish people from the land of Egypt across a Red Sea, chased by chariots, the sea closes behind them. The chariots get chowed by the salty Red Sea. They move on. They wander in the desert for 40 years. The garment was not working. It was just buffering and buffering and buffering. All of this was huge. Played a huge part in the expectation of who the Messiah would be for the people of Israel, the Jews, ancient Jews of that time in that part of the Middle East. So let's, let's have a look at this a bit more closely. Moses came out of Egypt. He passed through the parted waters of the Red Sea. He wandered around for 40 years and he delivered the commandments to the people of Israel. That's a very quick summary of the person of Moses. Like Moses, Jesus too came out of Egypt, passed through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River, entered into the wilderness for 40 days, and then goes up to the mountain to deliver new teaching. So Jews were aware of the symbolism and the imagery that Jesus is working with in real life. That Jesus is working with in real life. The, 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 is, the Israelites, are the Jews are wandering through the desert for 40 years and there's all sorts of temptations and golden calves and all sorts of mess ups and they get tempted into all sorts of bad decisions. Jesus wanders through the desert for 40 days with all sorts of temptations. The devil is trying to tempt him. That little passage of scripture, by the way, is actually not about temptation. It was more the picture of solidifying Jesus as a, as a Moses figure. He too wandered through the desert and was tempted, but he came out on top. He, could, he did what Moses and the people of Israel could not do. So there's something special about this guy called Jesus. And Jews are narrative storytellers. The ancient Jewish mind was, was, a, was not addicted, but the way that they communicated was through story. That's how they passed down information from generation to generation, beautiful narrative stories. So what does this mean? Matthew is suggesting to us that Jesus was the promise greater than Moses. The promise that the Jews had been waiting for for all this time. Who will deliver Israel from slavery. Give them a new divine teaching save them from their sins, and initiate a new covenant relationship between God and his people. That was the promise that was greater than Moses. And just a little side note here about the book of Matthew. The introduction and the conclusion are bookends to five sections of Scripture. Matthew isn't a fool. He's a very clever, strategic scribe and writer. And he's put together an introduction and a conclusion as bookends to five sections of Scripture which are designed to mirror the five books of Moses. So even the book of Matthew is shouting and screaming that this Jesus character is a greater than Moses. Jesus, greater than sign, Moses. And for people to come to that acknowledgement, there hadn't been a hero of the faith bigger than Moses. David was a cool king. But Moses was the man who led a people out of slavery, salvation. He brought salvation to the people of Israel while they were in slavery in Egypt. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, five books of Moses that are mirrored in the five sections of Scripture that we find in the book of Matthew. And this again emphasizes that Jesus is the new authoritative covenant teacher who's going to fulfill the storyline of the Torah because that's what the people of Israel were waiting for. They were waiting for this person to rock up. They were waiting for their Messiah. There was expectation and Jesus arrives and doesn't actually meet the expectation because he does things a little bit differently. We're going to unpack that now. And so the picture of a greater Moses is being painted here. You must understand, it was more powerful for the evangelism of the Jew in Jesus' day for somebody to say, this man is greater than Moses and this man is Jesus. It was a more powerful thing because they did not have any handles for the Jesus character. They had all the handles, all the bedtime stories, the hundreds or the thousands of years of remembering Passover, all sorts of religious festivities and feasts planned into the fabric of their culture was all centered around the person of Moses. And so if there was somebody who was now greater than Moses, guess what? You've got my attention. Because Moses... That oak was one hardcore, crazy Jew. We have to understand this. There's so much more to Scripture than just reading words off a page. The context here creates for us the, a majesty of a moment. This is not just uh, Jesus deciding one day to go and kind of talk. This is Jesus walking up a mountain, just like Moses walked up the mountain to get the law to bring to the people. That's the picture that people had in their mind when Jesus, a rabbi, walks up the side of the mountain. You see, the role that Moses played in Israel's history was that of freeing a nation from the oppression of slavery. It was the foreshadowing of a Messiah freeing humanity from the slavery of sin. Moses brings about salvation to Israel. Jesus brings about salvation to humanity. Jesus goes up the mountain just as Moses went up the mountain. And so we have to get into the mind of the ancient Middle Eastern Jew to understand what they were waiting so desperately for. And what they were waiting for was a story or a narrative to unfold in front of them. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for somebody to say, hey, I'm Jesus, I'm the guy. They had so much symbolism that was attached to this Messiah, that Jesus had to paint this picture in the way he walked and talked and acted. So he goes up the mountain, and it tells us in Matthew 5 verse 1, it says this, it's such a beautiful thing. So Jesus sees crowds gathering, he goes up to the mountainside and he sits down. And his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach. There's a feeling of Jesus waiting for crowds to gather. He goes up the mountain, and he knew that Moses went up a mountain. And he sits down, and he begins to teach. Now, one extra little bit of context here for you this morning. This is a bonus, hey? okay? This is for your test later today. Something that was a part of Jewish custom in the way in which the legal, legal authority was um, outworked or legal decisions were made in terms of Jewish law, the lawgiver always had the posture of sitting. So the person of legal authority always sat down. So now, friends, every time you see Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, sitting down, that's a hint for you to know that he is about to impart something of, from a place of legal authority. And you know, every Jewish person knew that. He wasn't sitting down by accident. There was something symbolic and important about what he was going to say if he sat down and started to teach. Because there are many other instances where Jesus didn't sit down. That's just a fun thing. Now go and have a look and find it. Now you see so much more than words on a page. So this is Jesus taking Moses to an entire different level. So Jesus sees the crowd. Now let's just take a moment here. This was a crowd just to kind of put people faces to a crowd. These were nobodies. These were misfits. These were unclean people. These were living as an oppressed people. They were oppressed by the Romans. They were poor. They were overlooked. They were the people that were gathering. 
And Jesus goes up the mountain as the new Moses, the better than Moses, the, all, the, the pow, more powerful than Moses. He sits down and he starts to list he starts to categorize a list of behaviors. I mean, we know what he says. Blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those, you know? That, that's what he did. So I, 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 I kind of cheated. I've got another little bit of context for you because we've got to understand the way in which Jesus is completely turning everything upside down. We can only really get that if we get this. Not only was sitting down a expectation of somebody who was giving away legal authority, but there was only two ways that things could be publicly, lists could be publicly categorized in Jewish culture. Only two ways that a list of people or a list of behaviors, like the Sermon on the Mounters, blessed are those, blessed are those, etc., etc. So there were rules for Jesus to follow in order to do the sermon. For him to do the sermon, he had to follow a set of um, expectations that all other rabbis would be following if they were going to do this type of cat categorization. It was a very common way of doing things, the way that rabbis would communicate like this. It was just a common way. For us, we go, oh, this is cool. It was fairly common. And so there was a rule in which they would do that. And this was the rule. There were only two ways that this could happen. One list was a rollout of names of saints usually describing their behaviors, focused on characteristics, so those who were observant, for those who were observant to the Torah and approved by God. So the one list of categorized groups of people that could be spoken out in public, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? But one list had to be a group of people who were basically good religious Jews, jumping through the hoops like gazelles through the Serengeti. Perfectly done. They were just doing everything well. The second group was the second list or the second public categorization process was that of characteristic by piety, you know. Oh, you know, I'm so holy. You know, I'm pious. I'm full of myself. I would have been pious because I would have thought there would have been pars available there. Piety, that sounds like a par party. I'm there, you know. I'm there, you know. I think we should start a movement. But the reality is, it was basically lists of religious success stories. And Jesus breaks away from both of those types of listing or categorizing of people and focuses on the most unlikely of people. Instead of doing what was traditionally done by rabbis, which was to praise good religious Jews for jumping through the right hoops in the right way, he lists and he blesses the marginalized. He completely breaks with convention. He has arrived to great expectation to be a Roman conquering religious elite, probably slightly corrupt with the tax collectors, you know, who would keep the social status quo of Israel as it was. In other words, the powerful would remain powerful and the weak would remain weak. Who wants to be weak and untouchable? All of that kept intact while freeing them from the Roman oppression and ushering in a new age of heaven. They were going to be so disappointed by what Jesus was about to say. A guy called Warren Carter says, In the Beatitudes, Jesus as has his disciples imagine a different world. This is about Jesus making us imagine what could be possible, to imagine a different identity for themselves, a different set of practices, a different relationship to the status quo. But why imagine? Why imagination? Not because it is impossible, not because it is escapist, not because it is a fantasy, but because it begins to counter the patterns imbibed from the culture of the imperial world that Jesus was in. We have, he called his disciples and those listening to use their imagination about what life could look like. About what life could look like. And so Jesus breaks away from praising people because of their observance to and obeying, obeying the law. And he breaks to a group of people that are marginalized. And I actually, if we have to be honest with ourselves, we're not really included in the religious ceremony that the elite had created. 
And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to just focus a little bit on the first three, I mean, the first one, two, three, four, I think that's four, the first four lines, the, the first four blessings, the blesseds, the first uh, God blesses of the Beatitudes. We're going to be going through this slowly. We're going to be chewing on this because it's a really beautiful thing. And then I'm going to be actually unpacking the importance of what it means, blessed. Because if we get what blessed means in the Beatitudes, which is God blesses those who were poor and realize that for they realize their need in Him. God blesses, God blesses, God. It goes on for, for seven, seven, seven lines, seven verses. If we understand what blessing Jesus is referring to, we get, we get it. If we don't, we could miss it. And I don't want us to miss that this morning. So the NRSV says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The New Living Translation says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Now there's a genius of a man called Eugene Peterson who writes these words in a way that I think is incredibly powerful. Just, I want you to sit and just listen to this. Just listen to these words of Jesus You're blessed when you know you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one you, you hold most dear. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more and no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God, His food and drink, and the best meal you'll ever eat. Isn't that beautiful? So we have this list that Jesus is working through, characteristics of behavior. It causes us to listen and lean in. Why? We humans, we want to know, hey, am I on the list here? Any of you ever had the moment where you knew that the team was going to be put on the team board on, I think, the Thursday before the weekend of sport? All you could think about on Wednesday night was, am I on the list? Am I on the list? Am I on the list? Get to school. Don't even say hello to everybody. Go and check. There I am, Matt, under 14. You know, I was a bit of a rugby player in my day. I could sidestep a few. Pillars. And... um, and I'd walk up and I'd see under 14A, no. Under 14B, no. Under 14C, no. I know what you're thinking, but not under 14D. Under 14E, on a good week, I belonged in under 14F. There was no G. I was the foundation of the DHS and the 14 rugby program. We want to be on a list. It's human nature. Jesus is brilliant here. This is a great communication technique. Everybody's leaning in. And he's not standing with tradition of listing saints and pious people. He's breaking with convention of the rabbis who saw, only saw people through the lens of obedience to the law. He's approaching this through the lens of people who are already living out the kingdom vision that he is custodian of. You either will believe him or you won't. That's what Jesus is doing here. So for us to really get into it, I want to wrap up this morning by just looking at what is, it, what is this meaning of blessed? What is this meaning of blessed? And over the weeks to come, we're going to dive into all of what this means, so that we can start to see the grid through which Jesus expects us to live. That we could live this picture, the perfect picture that he has for our lives can be found in these three chapters. 
The Sermon on the Mount is not just a random moment in history. The Sermon on the Mount is a pillar in the, in the, in the development of our faith in Jesus. It is a moment for us to stop and pause, to lean in and to listen and to figure out, am I in or am I out? It's a beautiful mirror for us to see the reflection of the state of our walk with him. That's what this does for us. That's what this does for us. So this word blessed or, or God blesses, the concept of this is God is blessing. There is a benefit for those who behave or are in the state of being. That's what this is in, es in essence is about. What we see here is a word that is very difficult to translate. I have did a whole bunch of reading, and there are all sorts of you know, thoughts about what this could, be, could mean. But a very clever guy called Scott McNutt, I was reading him. He's a very clever theologian. And he talks about the importance of the understanding of this passage rests on our understanding of this word. We want to get it. We don't want to miss it. And he unpacks that there are five themes at work in this one word called blessed or blessed, or God blesses, or the concept of. It's better in, 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 in this day to look at these ancient languages as concepts rather than words or phrases, because they were way more generous with phrases than we are with one word that describes a multitude of things. So I want to unpack this, and I want you to just lean in a bit, and we're going to be sending this out in the week, because I, just, I think this is really important for us to understand what is this blessing, what does this word mean for us? Today, in 2024, a couple weeks before an election, how do I still live this mandated life that Jesus expects me to live because I follow him? Yes, this was for a group of people on the side of a mountain a couple thousand years ago, but it's equally as important for us as followers of Jesus and the culture and context we find us to, to live our lives in a certain way in accordance to the shape that Jesus wants us to live. There's no good in a bunch of us Christians running around acting exactly like the rest of the world. What's the point of being salt and light? Spoiler alert, it, it's, we're going to get there. You know, what's the point of, of, of having a light and not standing on a hill? What's the point? And so Jesus is basically saying, if you follow me, if I am your guy, if I am your new Moses, if I, am, if I have bought you salvation then this is the way that you live. You're either in or you're out. You either hear me or you don't. So, five characteristics, five themes of the word blessed in this particular context. Number one, one who is blessed is blessed by the God of Israel. In other words, there was only one way to be blessed, and that was by the God of Israel. You couldn't be blessed by any of the other the God that was the emperor of Rome. You couldn't be blessed by the God that was, you know, drawing in a temple on a mountain in Greece. You couldn't be blessed by the God that had a couple arms and a elephant ears. You couldn't be blessed by Allah. You can't be blessed by your own individualism, by your freedom. It's only through anything that's a God in our lives can't bring you blessing. The only one who can bring you blessing is the God of Israel. Number one. So blessing was specific. Number two, it had a fancy word called eschatological focus. That's just a word that people that are bored with their lives use for end times. It had an end time focus. Ooh, Matt, what do you mean by the end times? I mean by this. It was the tense, the tense that is used, you know, past, present, future. The tense of use is the promise for the blessing, in this case, was for the future. It was a future tense. It was the looking forward to something. In other words, this blessing, while it focuses in the future, begins right now. Beautiful kingdom of God language in what this word blessing means. I get to live in the presence of a kingdom on this earth that's still to come. I get to see a glimpse of heaven. I get to see healing which is going to happen in the perf perfect moment in heaven. I get to see that enter the corrupt, sinful world right now. 
So number one, one is blessed, is blessed by the God of Israel alone. Number two, it has an end times focus. In other words, it's looking towards the future and how my now is affected, affects that future. Number three, and this is a strange word, so hold on with me. There was, there was conditionality to it. Condition. Oh, Matt, what do you mean there's a condition to it? Well, I do mean there's a condition to it. Condition, conditionality. So hold tight. Those Blessed are marked by certain characteristics or traits. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. The conditionality was marked by certain characteristics and those that are not marked by those characteristics. So just, just, just hear me here. This is not about measuring our moral progress. In other words, you do not have to be poor of spirit to get the blessing. What this Jesus is, what he is doing is he is opening up the fence and saying, there's more room, there's more room at my feet. This is not about uh, individual behavior. This is about Jesus opening up to a group of people that were basically excluded from a way of religious life that was happening in the day of the day. So you now don't have to leave and become poor in spirit and thirsty for justice. It would be wonderful if you are, but those behaviors, those characteristics are important to Jesus. You are blessed if you have that. There's a blessing on you if you are, if you are these things, poor in spirit. This, this wind keeps on knocking it, so I can't. Blessed are those who are poor and realize their need for him. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. So we don't have to become poor or mourning or meek to be blessed. Rather, these people, these characteristics are included in a way that they've never been before included. It's counterculture. We don't necessarily associate that type of lifestyle with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the victory of Jesus. And so, number one, blessing is from God alone. Number two, end times focus. Number three, there's a condition of characteristics. Number four, it's relational. You see, the religious Jews were too consumed with their relationship with them and God alone, that they forgot the poor and the marginalized around them. Jesus is saying there's much more inclusivity needed. This is just as important as your relationship with those around you. How do you treat and love one another? In fact, that is the way that it marks you as his disciple. Jesus says that later on. And finally, there's a contrast there's a big contrast to this word blessed. Jesus, what he blesses is countercultural. It's revolutionary. It therefore creates an upside down culture that's also inside out. He just flips everything on its head. They were expecting him to say, blessed are those who attend prayer and fast and behave in public and those who only walk super slowly on the Sabbath. And blessed are those who keep the woman at bay when they are menstruating or those who keep away the untouchables or those who maybe, you know, give one to Rome, keep one for me, give half to the synagogue. That's what was expected of Jesus. And he comes and he turns this whole thing upside down. When he talks about blessing, he's talking about a way of life that is so countercultural to the way that everybody was expecting him to live or us to live. So I want to sum this up. A blessed person, in other words, a blessed person is someone who, because of a heart for God, is promised and enjoys God's favor regardless of status or culture condition. I'm going to say that again. Listen to this now. A blessed person is someone who, because they have a heart for God, in other words, did you notice that the things that are listed there are the things that God's heart beats for? In other words, my heart becomes his heart. My thoughts become his thoughts. His ways become my ways. 
Because of a heart for God, I am promised and I enjoy God's favor regardless of status or culture. So some people say the word happy is a good word to use here to describe this blessed. Happy are those, happy are, and that's a great word. Happy is a very good word. The problem is in 2024, happy is being cheapened by all sorts of nonsense. So happy is a good word, or maybe a good umbrella word, but Scott McKnight basically says this. A really good way to read this is God's favor is upon. God's favor is upon. That's a pretty big deal. So I'm going to read these. God's favor is upon those who are poor and realize their need for him. God's favor is upon those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God's favor is for those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God's favor is on those who hunger and thirst for justice. God's favor is upon you. In other words, we get to live a life with God's favor upon us. He looks upon us favorably. Zephaniah 3.17 says, My God is mighty to save and he takes delight in me. That word delight, again, that's not a word that I can translate directly into one word of English. That word delight is better translated into the phrase, He spins around like a top, whooping with joy over me. God's favor is on me. God's favor is on you. In other words, if you have given your life to Jesus and you have subscribed to this mailing list, and this is the way that you want to live, God's favor is upon you. Just, just God's favor is upon you. We get that in our heads and we massage it through our lives. That literally changes the atmosphere of the rooms we walk into. When you walk into the room knowing that you're not walking in with your week ahead of you, you're walking in with the favor of God. Jesus calls us to a life in which God has favor on us. Now that is a very happy, wonderful, blessed place to be. And so a thousand odd years ago, Jesus is sitting on a hillside in the posture of someone giving legal instructions to people. And his instructions are this. God's favor is on you. Then in chapter 8, the very first thing that Jesus does after this is he goes out and he heals someone. Action. So over the next few weeks, as we start to encounter the richness of this text, this is not just the Sermon on the Mount. This is not just the Beatitudes. This is the perfect picture that Jesus has for his followers. We're either in or we're out. We either subscribe to these three chapters of living this way, or we, or we don't. It's as simple as that. And so I'm inviting you into this journey with us. I'm very excited about the freedom and the life and the wisdom that we can massage into our lives and the light that we can be to those around us if we lean in to what Jesus is saying. So stay tuned this week. There's going to be a little thing sent out that is going to be a little bit more detailed and summary to help give a bit more context to stuff. But this morning, if we can leave this place knowing a few things. This is all about action and doing. This is not just about sitting on a chair on a Sunday morning and coming back next week. Jesus was a big deal to the people of Israel because he started to surpass their expectations that they had of Moses. And to be a blessing, to be blessed by God means that his favor is on us. If we can go back with these three things and wrestle with that this week, I want to encourage you, go and read. 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. Go and read Luke 6. Go and start massaging it into, into your heart and mind. And I can guarantee you, I have a money-back guarantee for this. You will feel closer to Jesus than you felt if you start to engage with his words in a rich and deep way. Let's stand.